Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Siegfried S. Hecker. He is at Stanford University, where he is a research professor in the Department of Management Science and Engineering, a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation. Dr. Hecker is the holder of many distinguished awards, uh, including the Presidential Enrico Fermi Award. He is an emeritus director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. It's a great pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Poland as an accident of the war and raised in Austria from the time I was not quite two uh, at the end of the war until I was 13 when I came to the United States. And, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, my mother uh, was a remarkably strong woman and uh, she managed to get me as an infant uh, through war-torn Europe uh, particularly in what uh, now is Slovenia, Croatia, uh, and Austria. So she shaped me much through inspiration and just watching her uh, take a family with three small children at the end of the war uh, and to be able to make it through. And what I learned from her was always what she did, and that is to work hard. Uh, my father, unfortunately, I, I never really knew uh, we, as I mentioned, I was born in Poland. He was stationed in the German army uh, and then uh, never returned from the Russian front. Uh, so my father only had this very indirect influence. Uh, my mother eventually remarried, uh, and so I grew up uh, with a stepfather, uh, an Austrian also. And I would say the way that he shaped me most was my mother taught me that I had to work hard. He always said I had to work smart. <laughs> and you put the two together. What, what led you to the sciences? Did that come later or uh, uh, when you were an undergraduate? No, I, I was already, I had decided in, in high school that um, I wanted to do math and, and science. Uh, since I went to school in Austria through uh, most of, uh, all of seven grades and starting the eighth, it, it turned out I was always good in math and so I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, and then when I came to the United States, uh, we moved to Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and, and the Austrian schools had prepared me much better than the public schools uh, in Cleveland. And so I was particularly good in math and also good in science uh, from the eighth grade on. And so through high school, uh, I enjoyed that so much, I was good at it, uh, that I decided then and there that I, I wanted to be a scientist. And th this was in the uh, very late 1950s. I came to the U.S. in 1956. And at that time, sort of the big thing was nuclear physics. Uh, and so I decided while I was still in high school, uh, at East High School in Cleveland, Ohio, that I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. Uh, and eventually, after looking at, at several campuses, I wound up going to the local school, uh, at that time called Case Institute of Technology. I enrolled initially in, in nuclear physics, but then eventually uh, went into metallurgy and materials. And uh, what, what did you work on as part of your dissertation when you did your graduate work? So in, um, uh, what the, the reason I switched to metallurgy in the first place uh, was that I was the first one uh, to go to school in my family. And so what weighed pretty heavily on me is that I had to make a living someplace mm -hmm. uh, after finishing school. And it wasn't clear how long I would be able to go to school. And so I went into metallurgy because in metallurgy, you can either go on to graduate school or you can get a job, especially in a steel town uh, like uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and so I, I got into metallurgy and, and my interests there were mostly uh, in the area of composite materials uh, and especially to try to analyze the mechanics and materials aspects of composites. Uh, and so the idea was how do composite materials work uh, how do taking composite materials mean taking a couple of materials together and interweaving them in some fashion or alloying them in some fashion? Uh, and so I did a mechanics analysis uh, of composite materials and then also did the fabrication-related uh, work uh, on composites. And so my 
uh, dissertation work then was related to composite materials. But while doing that, I, I got an intense interest in the basic deformation behavior uh, of materials, and particularly metals and alloys. And so that's what I then wound up uh, doing in my postdoctoral work. And uh, you then, after uh, getting your degree, you, you wound up at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. How did, how did that come about? What year was it? And, and what was the place like then? So the most important way it came about is that they have snow in Los Alamos and mountains. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I grew up uh, in a little tiny town in Austria, in the Steiermark, actually not very far from uh, where our governor grew up, uh, Schwarzenegger. Uh, and, and I skied as a kid all the time. We went to Cleveland, and Cleveland's reasonably flat, not much skiing. So I saw this brochure uh, in the halls of Case when I was a senior that said summer jobs at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and it showed mountains and ski runs. Uh, and so I said, that's where I want to go. I also got married uh, when I, um, I finished uh, undergraduate school. So we went to Los Alamos uh, for our honeymoon in, in the summer of 1965. So that was my first introduction. And I went strictly because it was a famous place. Uh, it was the first time I had ever been west of Toledo, Ohio, in, in the United States. Uh, and we were on our honeymoon to boot. Uh, and so it was just an exciting uh, place to go. When I finished the summer, uh, I went back to then finish graduate school, uh, also at Case. Uh, and, and how did your work, uh, in a kind of general way, fit into the work of, of uh, uh, the weapons labs? Uh, uh, I, I guess the, the whole question of material science becomes uh, very critical as one designs nuclear weapons. So the answer to that is yes, but, but I'll get back to that later. That's not why I went to Los Alamos. I see. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, Los Alamos at, at that time uh, was just an absolutely fantastic institution. Mm. And, and of course, since their primary responsibility was the bomb business, uh, you know, everything what we used to call from cradle to grave, you know, you know, all the way from the design until you make sure you disassemble them again, but that's not why I went to Los Alamos. Building bombs or doing anything related to defense or nuclear was the farthest thing from my mind. I went there because when I read about Los Alamos, and since I was a metallurgist at the time, undergraduate, uh, just finishing up, uh, it had all this fantastic materials work. And so I went there, and they allowed me to work on whatever I wanted to work on. And so what drew me there was this interest in doing materials and metallurgical research. The weapons interest came much later than that. Which raises an interesting question. If, if there are students watching this program, what, what are the, the skills, the temperament, uh, that you see as, as critical to being a scientist and then secondarily being a material scientist? So of course, scientist is you have to know mathematics. And so that's your language. And so you have to have a deep appreciation and understanding of mathematics. And then you have to have curiosity as to how the world works, you know, all the way from the tiniest uh, all the way out uh, to the universe. And what I found uh, fascinating, even though I wanted to initially be a nuclear physicist, what I found fascinating uh, about materials and metallurgy uh, was that it's, in essence, the, the physics and the chemistry and the engineering of materials, all built together in order to understand materials. Whether you're understanding the physical properties, mechanical properties, electrical properties, or the corrosion properties, you have to understand physics, you have to understand chemistry, and of course, if you're going to use materials, uh, because that's what materials are for, they're the stuff that makes up things, uh, then you need to have some background for all of those. And so that's what I found interesting and if you're going to do materials research, then you have to have the understanding, at least at the atomistic level, uh, because that's what governs the behavior, whether it's electric conductivity or, or whether it's the strength or whether something fails by brittle fracture, just comes apart like a piece of chalk, or that you can actually stretch it out like a piece of soft aluminum. Trying to understand the atomistic mechanism as to what makes that go requires the other uh, sciences involved. And, and what do you see as your major achievement once you began applying these skills uh, 
as a scientist at Los Alamos? Well, well first, since Los Alamos allowed me to do what I wanted to do, and it, and it was very clever management uh, because, as I said, during a, a undergraduate, uh, when I was uh, finished undergraduate school, was there as a summer student, it didn't matter much. I was just looking for a summer job, have a good time, learn something. Uh, but it turned out I actually worked on plutonium at the time. And, and so that was 1965, got my first experience with this incredibly complex uh, metal. Uh, and so that's what started the interest. However, I came back to Los Alamos uh, as a postdoc, 1968 to 1970, and they just said, work on whatever you want to do. And so my initial work, and then I continued from postdoc, uh, continued that at General Motors Research Laboratories, uh, where I worked for three years, then I went back to Los Alamos again, had nothing to do with plutonium or nuclear materials. It was the essence of understanding the fundamentals of how materials deform. And particularly what, what I was interested in is how do materials and metals, or metals and alloys, deform under very complex conditions of multi-axial stresses. In other words, if you push and pull and twist, and also temperature, if you change the temperature. What governs the fundamental mechanisms how do you describe that? How do you turn that into physical laws that you can then wind up using to predict the behavior uh, and the performance of those materials? Uh, and so what I worked on at General Motors using these type of principles and tools was on something as mundane as sheet metal forming. So in other words, you know, how can you best actually stamp a car part uh, so that you can do it as well as possible, as cheap as possible. And what, motiv what motivated me, uh, this is now 1970 to 73, was that when we had the first big energy crunch. And so as I looked at the issue of gas mileage, for example, uh, you know, the most important thing that you find is the weight of the car. And if you're dragging around you know, several thousand pounds of steel, you know, that's an enormous burden. And so the thing that I looked at, when you know, could you replace the steel with aluminum alloys, for example? And then what are the challenges associated with, with, uh, with doing that? So, so, so my early work w was in this area of uh, mechanical deformation, and what we call plasticity, the ability of materials defor to deform uh, without breaking. I, I would say later on uh, then, uh, I got into the plutonium business and, and there I would say, you know, the greatest contribution uh, as they are is trying to get a better understanding of the stability of plutonium because plutonium is not only a radioactive material, but it's also the most complex element in the periodic table. And so getting a better handle as to how plutonium behaves, why it behaves that way, uh, and then eventually, you know, applying that to the health of the nuclear weapon stockpile of the United States, of course, was important also. So the scientific things that I did in plutonium, uh, I'm particularly very proud of. Those are also the things I still haven't given up uh, to this very day. Uh, it, I, it's interesting because as you describe your career, the, uh, one, one gets a sense that you were fortunate to be in an environment where uh, that made these studies possible. How important was the relationship of the labs to the University of, of California uh, to your work and the work of other scientists there? Well, for me personally, it was essential uh, because the logo when I got there uh, at uh, Los Alamos, at that time it was called the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. So the scientific helped because I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, the second part that helped, uh, in the subtitle, it said, operated by the University of California. Uh, and I wanted to be a university professor. Uh, once I finished graduate school, I said, that's the direction I want to go. Uh, actually, a good friend of mine at the University of Illinois, who offered me my first faculty job, said, Sig, go do a postdoc first. You know, they're going to be the most productive technical years in your life. So I did. And I went and did the postdoc. Uh, at uh, Los Alamos. Uh, if Los Alamos were not operated by the University of California, I wouldn't have gone there because, again, I was looking at this as a stepping stone to university career. Then, once I got there, the, the greatest impact the University of California had, it just ran throughout the entire environment and what you could call the DNA of the institution. 
It had this uh, sort of research environment, you know, the ability to inquire as to why things work, how they work, the ability to go and fund within the system of government funding people to pursue not only their interests, but then all, of course also what the government was paying us to do. And so it set up an environment that was a quasi-academic environment inside of a national laboratory. And it served this country, in my opinion, extraordinarily well you know, for 60 years. You moved on uh, and took your science uh, to the role of science administrator, really. And I'm curious about that transition and, and what the challenges, even before the end of the Cold War, were and are in, in managing a, a laboratory of uh, such complexity that is both complex in the technical work it's doing, but also related to U.S. national security. So how did that happen? Uh, not exactly voluntarily. <laughs> Uh, quite frankly, I, like, like many scientists uh, at places like Los Alamos, or for that matter, uh, university faculty, I, I had no use for management uh, or administrative duties, so that's not what I wanted to do. In fact, the reason I left General Motors at the tender age of, uh, of uh, let's see, I was essentially 30, uh, is I had three great years of research there at the research lab, but they wanted me to become a manager, and I said, for heaven's sakes, I don't want to become a manager. <laughs> So I went to Los Alamos, and I didn't want to become a manager. But, but then somehow, as I took technical leadership positions at Los Alamos, that became a natural place. You're a technical leader, and the, more, the better you do, the more sort of the management aspects you know, comes into play. Uh, and so I, I had some opportunities where, in essence, as many Los Alamos people would say, or, or faculty members, I sort of took that job in order to make sure that nobody else gets it who I would not necessarily agree with his or her philosophy and I'd have to leave this wonderful laboratory. So I did it in rear guard action to begin with uh, and I wound up uh, leading a very large uh, division, material science and technology division uh, in the uh, early 1980s. Then having done that for two or three years, and the division was very large, like 730 people, uh, I decided, you know, I didn't want to do this management. You know, I really still want to do my technical work. And so I actually stepped back from that management and headed up what we call the Center for Material Science, which was just a place of a dozen people or so. And that was 1985. And then I got this phone call from the University of California uh, where the vice president asked me, uh, uh, would you be interested in running the laboratory? And my initial reaction was no. I don't meet my own qualifications for the next director. But you took it. And so then the question is, uh, what are the skills required? I mean, what, what new level of skills do you need uh, to run a place like that? Many that I didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned on the job. And so I had to learn very, very rapidly uh, because it is a different world. Now, what I did have, uh, I think I had very good technical sense. Uh, I had also, uh, having been at the laboratory, uh, you know, off and on for, for 20 years by 1985, I really knew everything and everyone in the laboratory. Uh, and I think I had very good support from the laboratory scientists, engineers, uh, and the other professional staff. And so I really knew things about the inside of the laboratory, how it functions, what the issues were, how to lead it technically. However, you know, it was a laboratory of 10,000 plus people playing on the world stage, you know, in nuclear weapons and in many other important policy arenas. And so I had to learn how to run a business. I had to learn how you interface with Washington and Congress. And I had had very little interface uh, with uh, Washington and Congress. I had to learn how to interface with the public. And I had to learn something about policy and political science, which I didn't have before. Uh, and so it was an intense learning process, uh, and I became director in January of, of 1986. Uh, and, and then along with the, with the fast learning process, it, it turns out the world also changed dramatically uh, on us in the, in the next few years' time. And so 1989 comes, the wall falls, the Cold War is over, uh, what, uh, what 
were the challenges you confronted? Because really, the the U.S. Soviet rivalry was key to the mission, in a way, of the labs. Uh, and now uh, that was over. So a big part of my job, then, as director and and, and leader uh, of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, which it was called uh, by that time was to try to figure out the, the answer to that question. So wh why does the country need us anymore? I, you know, if the big bad Soviets went the way, why, does, why, do we, why do you need the bomb business? Why do you need a laboratory uh, uh, like uh, Los Alamos anymore? So, but that was only one challenge. Uh, uh, lots of other things uh, changed uh, in the meantime. The whole political interface, uh, uh, especially with Congress, changed. Because I, I would say, to a large extent, we were sort of politically isolated and insulated uh, from the from the the process in in Washington because we were fighting the Soviets. You know, we were helping to fight the Soviets. We were crucial uh, to U.S. Uh, in the Cold War, and so now all of a sudden, when maybe we were not needed as badly anymore, uh, Congress Congress could go in and and try to politicize the laboratories much more than they have, and they eventually did. And also at the same time, uh, another major shift uh, was whereas the nuclear weapons complex had its doors closed for decades and decades, it was self-regulated. The doors were swung open in the late 1980s. Uh, and quite frankly, when the public looked in, in many places uh, around the nuclear weapons production complex, it didn't like what it, what it saw. Uh, and so the challenge is, were immense in that direction. How do we react to the end of the Cold War, and how do we establish a new mission uh, as such? Uh, how do we deal with the new public scrutiny? H how do we now play in this new political uh, arena uh, that we didn't live in before? And, and I guess the labs were uh, a potential great resource for the whole discussions about industrial policy that were emerging as we suddenly saw that our competitors were not primarily necessarily the Soviets, but places like Japan. So it, that was very fascinating. That was another major change that happened in the late uh, 1980s. In fact, essentially when, uh, when I came into office. So my first couple of years in office, there was a lot of emphasis on the issue uh, of, of being industrially competitive. Uh, and, and a lot of push for the laboratories to get involved, not only in the defense business, but in what was called technology transfer. In other words, the questions that my senators from New Mexico asked and the Congress in general, if we have all of this scientific and technological horsepower, what can we do to use that horsepower uh, to help in our competition with Japan? Because from the mid to the late 1980s, uh, Japan was really riding high uh, uh, in uh, in its you know industrial uh, capabilities, and so yes, so there was much direction paid, uh, much attention paid in the direction of what does one do for industrial competitiveness. Now it, it turns out in the end, you know, the laboratories that's not where their greatest strength was, but the interlinking with industry, from my own perspective, you know, with the major U.S. industrial corporations was enormously beneficial in both directions. And I would say it helped the laboratory as much as we helped industry. And so it wasn't really a process of technology transfer. It was a process of how we work together uh, with industry. But that was just one of the other uh, uh, challenges. Uh, it, it sounds like in a, you know, essentially revolutionary situation like that, where you really have to uh, examine the premises of an organization that uh, your job must have been required knocking a lot of heads because you're basically uh, moving from secrecy to more openness to to new areas of research. What, 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 uh, how did you meet that challenge? Well, I'd say technologically, it wasn't that tough a challenge uh, because the, the people at Los Alamos had for years and years uh, always been excited about the latest science, mm -hmm. uh, in, including both creating it themselves and looking what other people had done. And so what they were interested in was the basis of the science, the engineering, and whether you apply it, let's say to map and sequence the human genome, or whether you do it for nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. was well, of course it's important, but we can do both. 
And in fact, by the way, we did both. You know, Los Alamos, while I was director, started the Human Genome Project, even though we were a nuclear weapons laboratory. And so the technical reorientation uh, was actually quite straightforward. Uh, I, we had to do a lot of work with my colleagues, and also I got a lot of advisors in from around the country to sort of to paint the big picture as to how our laboratory would still be needed even with the Cold War being over. Uh, and I can get back to that later, but, but to make the, the point in terms of the, uh, the specifics, the much more difficult aspect was the how to deal with the changing business climate. You know, all of a sudden Congress was much more concerned as to whether we use every dollar wisely. If we had construction project, did we meet the construction project goals? If we, what about, what did we do as far as safety and environmental, uh, you know, responsibilities? Those were really difficult, and there, uh, it was very difficult to bring our scientists and engineers from the world they used to live in, which was much more closed, to the world that they now have to live in with much greater scrutiny. You know, in the 60s and 70s, every now and then you had congressional visits, then they were mostly, uh, you know, for very supportive visits. Then all of a sudden, by the late 1980s, you know, we had one congressional committee after another coming to investigate the laboratories, and that change was traumatic for most of the laboratory uh, uh, staff. And, and so that, I would say, was the biggest challenge as to how one makes this switch to the new world that we lived in uh, in the 1990s. Science is a global enterprise, and, and it would be interesting now to explore the role of scientists in the Cold War period. And here I'm talking about uh, relations with other scientists uh, in places like the Soviet Union. Uh, Pugwash comes to mind, uh, the Federation of American Scientists, where we, we saw a lot of dialoguing, collaboration, which uh, helped reduce the tensions uh, 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 of the Cold War. Talk about the role of scientists then, but then how that changed with the end of the Cold War. Well, first of all, science is an international enterprise. You can only do science globally. You cannot do science, you know, in, in your backyard only. So there's always been the strong driving force, you know, for global interactions. And actually, as one looks back now, you know, sort of the really golden years of physics in the first half uh, of the 20th century, and you looked at where the key centers of physics were, you know, they, they were in the UK, they were in Germany, they were in Denmark, and they were with Enrico Fermi, uh, let's say, in, in Rome. Uh, and many of the Americans, like J. Robert Oppenheimer, you, you know, studied or did postdocs over there. So that the Russian Oppenheimer, uh, Yuli Hariton, uh, was one of Sir Ernest Rutherford's students actually at the same time Oppenheimer was there, even though they never met. So it was already, you know, very, very heavily cross-linked. So then with the uh, end of the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, then the Russian nuclear weapon scientists were pulled in. Our scientists in the United States, of course, the ones you mentioned particularly, and we had great ones associated with the University of California, like Herb York, for example, uh, or with Stanford, uh, like Sidney Drell, uh, they really brought the science to attention to say, let's control the dangers associated uh, with this nuclear standoff. Andrei Sakharov, for example, on, on the Soviet side. The, the Los Alamos people were not so heavily engaged in that aspect. They were engaged with, how do we do science with the Soviets? And so even during the Soviet times, there were visits of Los Alamos scientists two various Soviet scientific installation, exchanges in the area of accelerated technology, fundamental physics, high magnetic fields, and things of that nature. And so some of my colleagues, some of my elder colleagues at Los Alamos, had already established some of these links with the Russian enterprise, mostly the Russian Academy of Sciences, but actually among some of those scientists were their weapon lab scientists, except they were in disguise. You know, they always used the Civilian Institute as their home organization, but they were some of the weapon scientists. Then, when the curtain came down uh, and the Soviet Union collapsed and changed, then I personally found 
that is enormous opportunity, that the world had changed, our risk, our threats, everything had changed overnight. And then we, particularly at Los Alamos, but also my colleagues at Livermore and in Sandia, we jumped into action to build the bridges directly with the Russian nuclear weapons institutes and scientists. I went there for the first time uh, about two months after the Soviet Union collapsed in February of 1992. And going in and visiting, you know, inside these secret cities that formerly, you know, only our intelligence agents had any information on, it was remarkable. It was like old brothers reunited. And, and then Wes, talk a little about your emotions uh, uh, suddenly getting access uh, to these sites and uh, having a, a fellowship that really must have transcended whatever the fellowship was before when the Cold War existed. Well, for, for me, it was, it was particularly, uh, I would say, traumatic uh, because I never wanted to go to Russia. You know, having lost my father there somewhere uh, on, on the Russian uh, front as he was retreating uh, uh, from Poland through the Baltics and, and then never returning, and then having been brought up uh, and taught by the few male teachers that we had in Austria. We didn't have too many male teachers because so many of them never came back. But the few that did come back and they told the horror stories of the war with the Russians. Uh, and then having myself seen the Russian soldiers in Austria in 1953 when I went uh, to Vienna from my small little uh, Alpine town, uh, it just left an impression that I never wanted to go uh, to Soviet Union uh, or Russia. And, and all of that changed literally overnight. Uh, you know, so they invited us into, this place, uh, into these places. They showed us things that you know, we could only have dreamt of before. Uh, and then the Russian Oppenheimer, as we call it, uh, academician Yuli Hariton, that night at dinner explained to us the history of, of the Russian nuclear weapons program and its relationship to Los Alamos through the espionage of Klaus Fuchs, for example. And, and then the, the bond was almost instant. And so, you know, what we realized is how much we had in common, uh, is that, you know, I did the things that I did scientifically, you know, for the benefit of our country and for the freedom of what I thought, the freedom of, of the free world. They did it for the benefit of Russia. Uh, and so the patriotism was just as intense and we came almost you know, to the instant joint conclusion that look, that world's changed and we now ought to work together to make sure that the world stays a safe place. And, and that's what we did. So that was 1992. I've now been in Russia 41 times since 1992. And I have relationships with the scientific community, especially in these closed cities, that are among the best of my professional and personal relationships. And, and I guess the issues then became uh, questions such as how does one secure uh, the weapons material? How does one uh, de-escalate and reduce the numbers of, of weapons? And, and just any number of, of uh, co elements of cooperation in, in a kind of a whole new agenda. So what what drove me more than anything else um, was the issue uh, of in this new world that they now lived in, and, and that is where the you know, guns, guards, and gulags, uh, particularly the gulags, disappeared. And, and the guns and guards were no longer automatic because that country went through economic, organizational, political turmoil. Uh, is would they be able to continue to have a record of securing the fissile materials from the former Soviet Union in such a way that they would not get into the wrong hands? And we had the general feeling that what we're talking about is more than a million kilograms of fissile materials, either highly enriched uranium or plutonium, the two elements with which you can make a, a bomb. Uh, and it only takes, let's just say, from less than 10 kilograms for plutonium to a few tens of kilograms of highly enriched uranium, and, and they had more than a million kilograms. Uh, and the issue was, how are you going to do that? When the government, uh, uh, through uh, the, the government relationship, through what's called the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, 
uh, the U.S. said to the, to the Russian government, let us help you secure your fissile materials, of course the Russian government said, no, thank you, it's secure. When I visited and I talked to the scientists, you know, they knew that in that new world it may not be secure. I certainly knew from our experience in the United States where we've always had this wide open system that there are things that you have to do. You have to develop sort of a defense in depth. You not only have to put you know, fences and guards around the system, but you have to worry about the insider threat. So you have to be able to protect, you gotta be able to control the movement of fissile materials, and you gotta be able to account for it. And you also recognize that because of the huge numbers involved, there are uncertainties you know, in the accounting. So you have to have a system that has integrity. Uh, and and the, the Soviets didn't do it that way. They just depended on the guns and guards and then what I call the system of grave consequences. Uh, and so what we, the grave consequences being, you know, the, if you're lucky, the gulag. Mm. <laughs> uh, so that, that took a couple of years for us to build the right relationship with the Russians. And so what happened, when I went there in February of 1992, we agreed we should work together scientifically. Because in addition to guarding stuff, what the Russians wanted to do is nuclear power, nuclear energy. They said that's the salvation you know, of the Earth. We should do more nuclear energy. Let's work together in nuclear energy. Well, at that time, we had an administration that wasn't too keen uh, on, on nuclear energy. So that was a little difficult to do. So what we did instead was to work together on fundamental science. Uh, and so by September of that year, we did some joint experiments. And we continued to do that into 1994, when I was finally able to convince our government in the Department of Energy, uh, and then the Russians, that we should actually work together in this very sensitive area as to how to develop the right technology, the right methodologies to provide the type of security and safeguard that you need. And so I managed to get $2 million uh, uh, from Charles Curtis, who at that time uh, was the uh, undersecretary uh, of energy to start this program that we call MPCNA, Materials Protection, Control, and Accounting. And we called it the Lab to Lab Program in contrast to government to government uh, uh, program. Uh, and I got the $2 million in May uh, of uh, 1994. By June, I was in, in Russia and we signed contracts to work together uh, and began a program that's still going on today where we've spent you know, over a billion dollars uh, of American taxpayers' dollars to help the Russians protect and guard and safeguard uh, their nuclear materials. This, this was the beginning of a new career for you. Uh, you've you've uh, traveled all over the world. You you visited India. Most importantly, you visited uh, North Korea several times. You held up the, the plutonium in their reactor. Uh, tell us a little about this new role, because uh, it, it's, a, it's a very different world. It's a world where the nuclear threats take the form of proliferators and alliance between proliferators and, and underground networks like the AQ Khan network. How does the, the role of the scientists change in this uh, uh, new environment? So that was part, uh, going back to your previous question, that was part of sort of refocusing the mission uh, of the laboratories. And so what we did in the transition uh, of, uh, of, the, of the end of the Cold War uh, is we then redefined ourselves the mission of saying the central element of that mission is still that, that we, the three, what are called the weapons laboratory, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and Sandia National Labs, have to take care of this country's nuclear stockpile. Uh, however, then associated with that is what I called reducing the global nuclear danger. And that became evident to us in 1992-93. That world had changed, whereas prior, we were concerned about Soviet strength, Soviet missiles, Soviet nuclear weapons and warheads. Come 1992, we were concerned about Russia's weakness, the inability to actually be able uh, to manage an entire complex. And so then we set out to say, let's now define in much more direct terms 
What are the challenges associated with such things as controlling the safety and security of nuclear weapons and nuclear materials? And then how do we deal with the issue of the spread of nuclear weapons? And how do you look for potential uh, activities like the one that Saddam Hussein was carrying out in the 1980s that were found out in 1991, and the potential spread to other countries, Iran, North Korea, at that time Libya, but we were principally concerned initially uh, about Iraq. And so how do you use the technical capabilities uh, and the background experience of our people in the nuclear weapons business to actually help uh, uh, to look at those dangers? So I would say from 1992 to 97, at the end of 97, I finished uh, my directorship at Los Alamos and went back to the faculty, so to speak. Uh, then I paid a lot of attention to that. And being director of the Los Alamos National Laboratories gave me instant access to all of these other places around the world. So wh when I went to Russia, you know, I was the director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. They knew of all of the famous names and knew all the things were done. In 1994, I went to Minyang in China. That's what we would call the Chinese Los Alamos. And I was inside of their nuclear weapons laboratory. And similarly, uh, and then later on, I went to various places. As you said, India, I went to Kazakhstan. And then I've been in North Korea six times uh, in the past uh, six years. So it, it was a natural change because what we did is we changed with the nuclear threat changing. Uh, and so we still had to worry about the stockpile, but we realized that the threats were much greater. And then particularly you know, focused on proliferation-related aspects and the possibility of nuclear terrorism. And this was long before 9-11, by the way. Uh, as I listen to you talk about your career, and I, I've read uh, several of your articles in preparation for this talk, I, I, uh, I get the sense that uh, over time, uh, what evolves in your uh, thinking is a, a set of political science skills. Because when, when, you, uh, when I read your article about North Korea, you, you really delve deeply into the political aspects of this set of problems related to proliferation. So, so we have to not just look at what North Korea is doing technically or what Iran is doing technically and try to control that, but we have to also factor in the domestic politics in those countries and even the domestic politics in the United States right. so that the, these, these, uh, these things don't get out of control. Talk a little about that because you have become a practicing uh, a political scientist in the sense that you, that you really do have to understand the, the politics here. Well, I would say my political science colleagues at Stanford uh, would not give me a union card for <laughs> political <laughs> science. So, so yes, I, I had to get into all of these other aspects, you know, not the political aspects, of course, but, but also uh, the, the economic, the cultural, the historical. And I learned that mostly in Russia first in order to try to understand what motivates the people in the Russian nuclear complex. You know, President Bush the first was most concerned that once the Soviet Union would come apart, that their nuclear scientists would go and work in Iraq. Well, it turns out if you understand Russian culture, that's not where they were gonna go. That's not in their interest whatsoever. Now, some associated particularly not with the heart of the nuclear weapons complex, certainly wanted to sell stuff, but they weren't gonna go work uh, in Iraq. And so I learned, again, mu much like learning the business of running an organization, uh, I learned it in real time, uh, on the job. And I must say, I found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, and, and since I was a techie, you know, in most of my uh, early to mid-career, uh, I didn't you know, go to a place where you had the richness uh, of a Stanford or, or UC Berkeley in, in history and political science and all the other things. Uh, and so I never had full enough appreciation even for the United States. When I dealt with the Russians a lot, particularly with all the trips that I've, that, that I've taken, I became fascinated by, it, by their history, by their culture. 
And in order to understand the culture, you have to understand art. You have to understand music. So you have to understand why Pushkin is the most revered of all Russians who ever lived. And so I dug into that in a major way, and I enjoyed it immensely. It actually helped build what was sort of a vacuum uh, in, in my life, in, in, my, in my early education. Uh, and then I also found that unless you can't tackle these issues unless you understand the greater political context. Because, for example, if you're going to understand why do countries have nuclear weapons or can they get nuclear weapons, so the, the, the nuclear weapons is a combination of capability times intent. Okay, the capability, we technical people are pretty good at evaluating. And so that's what I went there for, is to evaluate the capability. But the intent, the technical stuff, doesn't do you any good at all. You have to understand all of these other things. So, so I began to get more and more involved in that. And then particularly after I left the directorship in 97, where I did much more of the international travel, many of the other countries, I tried to learn more and more and, and sort of you know, walk a mile in their shoes instead of just in our shoes. And, and I thought that to be one of the most important lessons that I've learned is that what you have to do. But then in terms of political science, so in 2005, I came to Stanford uh, uh, first uh, as, a, as a visiting professor. And then I've stayed there the last uh, additional almost four years. Uh, and so whereas I thought I was getting pretty good in the political science, I went to Stanford and I found out that I know nothing about <laughs> political science. That actually there is a reason why political science has the science part of it. And so I was enormously impressed, impressed with the people with the approach. And then not only at Stanford, but the others I've interacted with. So I would say it's sort of a, a second career where I've had to go through, learn again, and I try to you know, exercise and practice as much of that as possible. What, what should we worry most about uh, as we confront North Korea and, and, and now uh, Iran? I know you're worried about a, a, a possible uh, relationship between them in, in, in the exchange of materials about uh, either weapons or missiles. Is that correct? Uh, one of the things that you worry about? Yeah, well, yes, I, I, I do worry about collaboration between North Korea and Iran because uh, that's potentially a marriage made in hell, uh, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. But, but let me back off first to, to answer your question more specifically. So, you know, what do I worry about in, in the nuclear arena? So what are my greatest concerns today? Uh, my, my greatest concerns are associated with the potential use of nuclear weapons by terrorists. Nation states still tend to be deterred by a lot of things. It doesn't necessarily, I don't think we need nuclear weapons to deter North Korea. We have plenty of conventional firepower to deter North Korea. Uh, however, uh, the, the terrorists, of course, you can't deter. But nation states tend to be deterred. And so North Korea has had nuclear weapons at least since 2003 and perhaps longer. And yet they haven't done anything really foolish with those nuclear weapons. What I'm, I'm not quite as sanguine about Iran uh, because I understand their leadership less and I understand Iran less. Uh, and so I'm not quite as sanguine that Iran won't do anything foolish with nuclear weapons besides uh, even if nuclear weapons do get into the Iran government's hands, it, it changes the dynamics in the Middle East, uh, in, in my opinion, in a terribly drastic and wrong direction. And so uh, getting nuclear weapons in the hands of Iran really is a concern. But the greatest concern is still actually the nuclear weapons or more likely the nuclear materials getting out of the hands of the control of governments. And that's also why I worry about a North Korea-Iran uh, uh, connection. North Korea has nuclear weapons. They've demonstrated those with a couple of tests. One not so successful, one pretty good. They have nuclear fissile materials with which you can make weapons. Iran, to the best of what we know today, does not have either nuclear weapons or the fissile materials yet. What Iran has done now since about 1987 time frame is put the pieces in place by which they could make fissile materials, but have not made them yet as best as we know. And so the reason I worry about 
the cooperation between the two is the things that Iran lacks, North Korea is in a very good position to help out. And then in the other direction, there are actually a few things that Iran could wind up helping North Korea that would make it a, a greater burden. But still then the issue becomes Iran with nuclear fissile materials, which could then get out of the hands of, of the government through the Revolutionary Guard into the hands of, uh, of who knows you know, who in the Middle East is the greatest concern. But if I rank my concerns on the basis of, of greatest risk from the standpoint of nuclear materials getting out of the hands of government into the hands of terrorists, Pakistan actually outranks both North Korea and Iran. And that is because they're, you are concerned about whether their uh, weapons are secure? And so in Pakistan, yes. it's, it's twofold. Uh, the greatest concern I still have is the nuclear materials uh, and the security of nuclear materials. It turns out Pakistan has both highly enriched uranium. That's the I path see. to the bomb that they developed first. And that's where A.Q. Khan, you know, initially became a national hero because he was able to organize a band of European greedy businessmen to help him and Pakistan develop enrichment capabilities to make highly enriched uranium for their bomb. They also have reactors that can make plutonium and they're building more, which is also of great concern. So Pakistan has both highly enriched uranium and they have uh, plutonium. And they have built and demonstrated the bomb. Uh, and they sit nervously poised vis-a-vis -vis India. Uh, and so the more prepared they are, the more likely they might be of actually losing control of a nuclear weapon. The more prepared they are to retaliate uh, against India. And so in Pakistan, one actually does uh, have some concern about the control of the nuclear weapons, but much greater concern yet about the control of the nuclear materials. Because when a weapon is missing, you know that. You know, weapons have serial numbers stamped on them. When nuclear materials is missing, it's much more complicated because these are industrial materials. They're dissolved, they're cast, they, you know, they're evaporated. They are, and they, they, you know, some of it is waste. And so managing that enterprise in such a way that you don't have enough material from which you can make a bomb is much more complicated. And, and that's the essence of the nuclear security summit uh, that President Obama uh, is pulling together uh, here next week, uh, is to get countries to pay more attention to those issues. So, uh, and then of course in Pakistan, then in addition to that is the political situation. Uh, you know, the government is weak, uh, and Osama bin Laden is up there somewhere uh, near the border. Uh, A.Q. Khan has demonstrated that he can use the internal system, you know, to personal benefit and at least export equipment, if not material. Uh, and, and so you're really concerned. It's got all of the elements uh, that provide you with a nuclear nightmare. Uh, Dr. Hector, I regret to say our time is out. We're going to have to bring you back sometime in the future and, and do a, a second talk. This uh, was uh, absolutely fascinating, and I want to thank you very much for, for coming on our program. Oh, you're, you're very much welcome. It was a pleasure for me to be here. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.